ASBC and welcome to Sundays Online. If you are a guest with us today, my name is Kerry. I'm on staff at the church. It's my privilege to welcome you to our service. We would really like it if you'd introduce yourself to us by heading to the link that's on screen behind me and one of our staff will get hold of you in the week ahead. We got our text groups up and running this week. If you uh, would like to be a part of one of those, it's not too late. If you're not connected to a small group and want to be placed into a small community where you can receive encouragement over the next few weeks, drop us an email at info at sbc.za.net and we'll add you to one of those. This week is Easter and we are really excited to celebrate with you as our church. We have chosen the theme we will remember and you can start remembering from today already as a family by engaging with our next gen curriculum. And then in the week ahead, we're gonna remember in three different ways. Through our midweek moment, we were remembering Christ's journey. On Good Friday, we will remember the cross together. And on Easter Sunday, we are going to remember the resurrection together. Both of those Easter services are taking place at 9 a.m., but you can join us from 8.45 for our live chat. Speaking of remembering, I'm going to hand over to Nikki Fetting in just a second. She's our children's minister, and she just wants to encourage us to create some memorable moments uh, as our families in this lockdown period. And then we're going to hear from Anne and Peter Johnson, one of our elder couples. They're going to encourage us with some scripture and pray for us. And then Mark Wood is going to be bringing this morning's message. If you want to respond to that message through worship, you can use the link that's on screen. We'll remind you of that at the end of the service. And if you'd like to worship God this morning by giving, you can make use of the bank details on screen now and uh, contribute towards the ministry that we do here at SBC. That's it from me for today. I'm going to hand over to Nikki and trust that you enjoy the rest of the service with us. Hello SBC, it's so good to be back with you again. My family was on holiday in the Western Cape and we'll always remember rushing back home to lock ourselves down for these 21 days. But we'll also remember the great family time that we, had, that we had together. We'll remember the laughter and the fun, the board games, the extra food, and all the good bits that come along with being with family. Memories are really precious. Memories are also really powerful. Shared memories unite us in the same way that shared experiences do. Now I'm wondering, after 10 days of lockdown, what memories are we making in this time? What will we remember about lockdown when we look back in the future? I urge you to make the most of this really unusual time to leverage memory. Take time to look back and remember your past, and then take time to make future memories, to make remembrances in the now. Moms and dads, your Deuteronomy 6 mandate remains the same, even if you are in isolation. Parents are to share their faith with their children at all times. Will our children remember us doing this in these 21 days? Now as a church, we are going to spend this Easter week remembering. We will remember the cross and we will remember the resurrection. Will you join us and do that together as a family? Will you remember to take time to read God's word, to pray and to worship together with us? The Next Gen team has put together a little package um, for Easter and we've posted that on the WhatsApp groups. They went out on Friday. Have you had a look at it yet? Remember, you don't have to be a Pinterest perfect family. Perfection is not what we're aiming for nor are we asking for you to do absolutely everything. Your children are going to remember the time that you spend together. They're going to remember the fun, and they're going to remember those moments that you enjoy together in God's presence. Make the most of this time and enjoy it, because we will remember it. Good morning, SBC. Welcome to Sunday Online. Thank you for joining us. We are missing you all, but we are very thankful that we can connect with you all in this way. So whilst reading in Romans 8 this week, uh, I was once again struck by this wonderfully encouraging truth from God. And Paul is writing to the Christians, to the followers of Christ. And he says the following, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you fearful today, anxious? Are you feeling far from Him? Do you feel a failure, rejected? The Sovereign God encourages you today to know that He loves you and wants an intimate relationship with you. Let's put our faith in Him. Let's pray together. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you are here with us now by your Holy Spirit. Please speak to us through the word that Mark is going to bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we know you as a true and a faithful God. May we live for you and for you alone. Thank you for this powerful encouragement. May you use Mark's message for your purposes in our lives. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Now we look forward to what God has laid on Mark's heart for us. Over to you, Mark. Good morning, church. Last week, Matt Johnson preached a fantastic message on the gospel. And today I'm going to build on that message and preach a gospel-centric sermon. And I can almost see some of you sitting there, rolling your eyes, thinking, Mark, I've responded to the gospel. Can we please move on to something else? And I want to warmly encourage you this morning that the gospel is not something that we graduate from. It is the most important message we will ever encounter, and it is always relevant and applicable to our lives. In fact, our text this morning is going to show us that the gospel is not just for the unbeliever, but for the believer as well. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who will believe. At first, it may seem like Paul is uh, speaking about being bold and preaching to the unbeliever. But if you go back one verse to find the context, you see something quite interesting. In Romans chapter 1, verse 15, uh, Paul says that I'm eager to come to you to the church, to all of those in Rome. And so essentially what he's saying is, I am eager to come and see you, the church, and preach the gospel to you. And I'm not ashamed of it, because it is the power of God for all who will believe in it. Church, this morning, I want to say to you, the gospel is relevant to you. You need to be asking the question, how does it apply to me in my life right now? And I want to give you a thought that you can ponder on. Uh, in our sinful nature, we love to be told things to do, and then we love to go and do them. And when we do them, we often get a sense of achievement and we feel good about that. And we can even apply that to our relationship with God or our faith. So often when we want to evaluate how we're doing, we might think things like, um, am I going to church every Sunday? Am I reading the word um, every day? Am I praying a lot? And if we can tick those boxes... Uh, we often feel good about ourselves and we feel like we are achieving something in our faith. But the scary thing is that it is possible to go to church every Sunday. It is possible to read the Bible from back to front. And it is possible to pray a lot and to never really encounter God in a relationship in that. Because those things are religious, ritualistic uh, habits. And if we are simply doing them, for the purpose of ticking a box, then often what happens is we end up driving a wedge in our relationship uh, with God. A better question to ask ourselves, uh, how are we doing in our relationship with the Lord, is not, am I going to church every Sunday, but when I go to church, am I sensing God's presence with me? Um, when I read my Bible, am I hearing God's voice? That is evidence of relationship. If you are close to the Lord, then you will hear his voice. If you are close to the Lord, you will sense his presence. He is a living person. He speaks and he's with us. And I want to encourage you, church, if you find yourself falling into performance-based thinking, and I often do, then the answer to that is the gospel. I need to remember in those moments how I came to God at first. I did not come to him based on anything I'd done. I came to him humbly, empty-handed, completely trusting in what Jesus had done for me on the cross. 
And that is how we continue to come to him, no matter how long we've been walking with him. The gospel is still relevant to you, church. Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that he's not ashamed. It's a powerful proclamation and it's courageous. And often when we hear people say things in the negative like that, they are speaking that way because the uh, circumstances surrounding them would often allow for the opposite response. I'll give you an illustration to illustrate what I mean. A child on a playground who encounters a bully might in that moment, if they are brave and courageous, be able to raise the finger and say, I'm not afraid of you. And watching that story, watching that situation, we would know that that child is being courageous because they have every reason to feel afraid in that moment. He is bigger. He is stronger. Um, And so this is the context that Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed into. It's a tough environment. He is preaching the gospel, a gospel about a God who died on a cross to a group of people who are really struggling to receive this message. Um, In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23, uh, Paul unpacks this further and he says, I preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. He often encountered negative, strong negative responses to his preaching. And this word for stumbling block in that uh, verse is, the Greek word is scandalon, which we get our English word scandal from. And it's a great word to describe how a Jewish person feels about this message. They believe it is scandalous to think that God could humiliate himself in that way and, and die on a cross like that. They won't even pronounce the name of God. In uh, our Western culture, we love to be able to say things out loud. And so we've inserted into the letters uh, Y-H-W-H. We've inserted A and E and, and we pronounce it Yahweh or Yahweh. And the Jewish person won't even pronounce the name of God out of reverence to who God is. They won't even speak that name. Can you imagine how difficult it is for someone with that viewpoint on God? And it's great that they see him that way because he is that great. For them to understand a gospel that belittles him and places him and humiliates him on a cross is very difficult. Uh, In the Middle East, in the Arab countries, it's just as difficult. Uh, I once uh, told a Muslim friend that uh, Jesus died on the cross and uh, I can remember his face contorting at the thought of that. And he doesn't even believe that Jesus is God. He just believes that Jesus is a good man, a prophet. And for him to think that God would do that to such a good man, to a prophet, is unthinkable. Uh, What the Muslims believe happened was that they believe in the crucifixion. They believe that it is an event that happened. But they believe that Judas Iscariot was placed on the cross and was punished for his sins. And God simply placed an image of Jesus in front of Judas. And that's why there is some confusion around the identity of the person. But they cannot accept in any way that God would treat a prophet like that. How much more difficult for this person when I told them he did do that, and he didn't just do it to a good man or a prophet. He did it to his his own son. In that moment, I remember the repulsion uh, on his face, the uh, rejection to what I was saying. And for a brief moment, I will admit, I felt a bit of shame for what I was sharing. I thought for a moment, is there something else that I can share? And my answer is, no, there's nothing else I can share because I can only share the truth. And this is the truth. This is what happened. In fact, the humiliating aspect of the cross becomes one of the strongest defenses to its authenticity. Some people believe that 12 men got together in a room and concocted a story about a guy dying on a cross so they could confuse the world and manipulate them. And if 12 guys wanted to make up a fake religion in this Jewish culture, the last thing they would have thought of doing is thinking up a God who's going to die on a cross. There is no way that that would spread. There is no way that other people would hear that and want to receive that message. They would have come up with a million other options. But the only option they have is the same option I have. 
the same option Paul has. And he's not ashamed of it. You know why? Because it is the truth. This is what happened. Jesus Christ is God. And he did die on a cross. And we can't change that message to fit the reactions that we're going to get from people. Why wasn't Paul ashamed? Well, he goes on to say in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that he's not ashamed because it is the power of God for salvation. It's a powerful message. There's power in these words. Um, it might be humiliating to the Jew. It might be foolish to the Gentile. But it is the power of God to save those who will believe. In my own context, um, people who know my dad have often said to me, this man is one of the most stubborn people we've ever met. And I must say, I've never seen my dad change his mind on anything except one thing, the most important thing. When I was a teenager, I used to share my faith with him. And in his staunch atheism, his steadfast aggression, he would often hurl insults and swear at me. He once threatened to throw the Bible at me. Um, and our conversations would often end badly with me running off to the room, crying into my pillow, praying for him. And often those prayers, I would even say, Lord, you can't save this man. He's too hard to save. But today, my dad professes Christ as Lord and Savior. I remember having conversations with my mom in the car um, and sharing my faith. And she would often cut me off halfway. She wouldn't even let me finish. And she would often, uh, her response would be this. She would say, Mark, you're wasting your time. I'm too far gone. I am already going to hell. There's no point in sharing this message with me. But today, my mom professes faith in Christ. There is power in these words in the gospel. Um, the most powerful testimony, one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard, Anita and I were in Pretoria and we met a man who'd been in jail for 25 years and he had committed armed robbery and murder. And so he was in, in jail uh, on death row and on the very day that he was to be executed, Nelson Mandela abolished the death penalty in our country, the day that he was going to be executed. This new lease of life didn't change anything for him. He entered into a maximum security area of the prison and he said to us that he wanted to get the highest status that he could possibly get. And to get the highest status you could get with the other criminals, you had to murder one of the wardens uh, that was taking care of you. And he did that. And so he achieved the status of becoming a general. He was one of the most feared, if not the most feared man in the entire prison. And he told stories of sitting in uh, the sleeping room, 50 men. And because he was the general, he could choose the first spot to sleep. And he always chose the corner. And he would sit up in the corner with a knife, sleeping, sitting up, waiting at any moment to pounce and kill any man who would try and take his spot. He tells the story of a preacher coming to the prison one day and doing a Bible study. And this preacher was doing a Bible study with some inmates. And this general uh, walked past. And in that moment, God gave the preacher a word of knowledge about him. And out loud, he, he shouts out to this general this word of knowledge. And the, the general turns around and, and in his anger, he says to the preacher, Who told you that about me? And the preacher <laughs> held his hands up and said, If you want to be angry at someone, be angry at Jesus. He told me. Later that evening, the general's in the shower, and as he reminisces on the day, anger starts to well up in him again as he thinks about um, this truth statement that was said to him by the preacher. And he remembers that the preacher said he got that truth statement from Jesus. And in that moment in the shower, the general raises his eyes to the heavens and shouts out at Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you are real, be a man and come and speak to me face to face. And the very next moment, he fell to his knees and he started weeping. As God's presence came into the room. And he got up from that encounter, changed, changed by the gospel, changed by the very name of Jesus. And he goes into the room that he shares with these other 50 men. And his heart is so different. Even that first night, 
that he starts to notice guys around him who don't have blankets and he goes and he takes his own blanket and gives it to them. He notices guys where their blankets have fallen off him and he uh, covers them again with blankets. Can you imagine the confusion and the shock in those inmates when they saw how the gospel had changed this man in a moment? Guys, the gospel is powerful. I have seen it change lives. I have seen it turn friends and family members to Christ. And I want you to know where the power comes from. It does not come from the eloquence of the words. It does not come from the accuracy of the words. It does certainly does not come from the person that's sharing the words. The power of the gospel comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is with you and me. He's with us. And I want to say to you, the moment you share the gospel in your weakness, in your limited way, God is able to move in power to change those people's lives. You may often experience a negative reaction. I often did. But what follows down the road is the Holy Spirit continues to work in the hearts of those people. Many times after you have simply shared the gospel, God will continue to work and turn their hearts towards him. You will be amazed. Paul goes on to say that um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. That's such an important word. The word in Greek is P-A-S, pass, and it means everyone without exclusion. So this is a universal call to everyone. No one is left out. We see that in Revelation when God shows us the end and all of the people that will follow him and worship him. It says that from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, they will come and worship him. No group will be left out. There is no exclusivity uh, in Christianity. Christianity doesn't belong to a race. It doesn't belong to a class. It doesn't belong to uh, people that are better than other people in the, uh, how good they are and how bad they are. It is for everyone. Anyone can come. But this is not universalism. This does not mean that everyone will be saved because Paul goes on to qualify and he says, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And so we see the qualification being that um, you have to believe. You have to respond to this gospel. You have to realize that it is true and you have to choose to put your trust in it. And not everyone is going to do that. But for everyone who does that, they will be saved. What an encouragement to share our faith. You don't have to ask yourself, should I share it with this person? Is this the right person? The call goes out to everyone. And the response will come from those who belong to the Lord. They will believe. I remember a situation once with a work colleague where I knew God was working in her heart because um, every time I would share something about God, whether it was a devotion at school, she would always come up to me afterwards and say, can I see your material? I really want to ponder on that a bit longer. And I remember one day at a star function, she proudly told me that um, she was allowing her children to go to Bible classes at school because she wanted them to be exposed to every religion so that they could come to their own conclusions about faith and not just follow what she believes. And I said to her, that's commendable. But I was very interested in where she was at with Jesus. So I said to her, what do you think about Jesus? And she said she's open to him and she likes a lot of things about him. But she doesn't think that religion uh, should be exclusive. So she thinks that um, all the roads will lead up to the top of the mountain. Every religion will get to God in the end. And it was a tough moment for me. Because I realized that what I was about to say next was probably going to offend her. But what I said next to her was this. I said, Jesus doesn't allow for that. John chapter 14 verse 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And I tried to explain to her that Hindus, you can come. Muslims, you can come. Nominal Christians, you can come. Atheists, you can come. This is a universal call to the whole world to come. But the only way to get to God 
is to trust in Jesus. He is the only way. And so there is a condition on those who will believe in the gospel. And she responded to that in the way I expected. She got angry and she said to me, I have a huge problem with that. And uh, she stormed off. And for a moment, I felt a bit guilty and thought that I overstepped the mark, that I was I maybe a bit too bold and too direct. Um, but I want to say to you that I stand before you today, church, years later, knowing that what I said in that moment was from the Holy Spirit, and it was the truth, and it was for her. And the wonderful thing about the gospel and its power is this, that it works long after we've spoken to the person. Today, that lady professes Christ as her Lord and Savior. So in some points of application, I want to encourage you. First, in what way can you apply the gospel to your life right now? Even in my marriage, the Bible tells me that I must love Anita the way that God loves the church. No amount of human striving is going to get me anywhere near that. My only hope in that uh, goal is to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. I need your help every day in my marriage. I need your help every day to love Anita the way you love the church. I'm depending on the gospel when it comes to my marriage. Are you struggling with performance-based thinking and faith? Church, I want to encourage you. Come to the gospel. Come to Jesus. Trust in him. Rest in him. Enjoy him. He has already done everything for you. There is so much peace that you'll find in that relationship. Are you ashamed of this gospel? Church, we know it is hard to share our faith. One of the reasons why it's so hard is because we are scared of the response that we're going to get. You are probably going to get a negative response. Most of the time, I have gotten negative responses to sharing my faith. But the encouraging thing for us this morning is the reminder that there is power through the Holy Spirit in the words that we speak. Don't worry about getting the words right. Don't worry about being perfect. Just share what you know about Christ. He can use that. And he can use that to turn any heart. The hardest heart can turn to Christ. At this time, with the coronavirus uh, going all over the world and this world being so much fear, People are primed and ready to receive the gospel. I want to challenge you. Easter is coming up. We have live streams that we are calling people into. There are people watching this stream today and have been the last few weeks. They haven't been in church for a long time, but they are coming now. I've invited someone to watch a stream today who I've invited to church many times. They've never come, but today I'm trusting that they will come and watch. Who are you going to invite in the coming week to watch our streams? Matt's going to continue to preach the gospel. It's Easter. If you're uh, feeling um, like you don't really want to hear that, I want to pray that you'd soften your heart because we need to be uh, sharing our faith. We need to be preaching the gospel, and we're going to continue to be doing that as a church. We are trusting that in this season, at this time, all around the world, God is going to turn thousands and thousands and thousands of people to him. We're praying that every church would flourish, that every stream would just uh, be filled with people um, who are going to hear the gospel. And I want to encourage you, church. God is going to put someone on your heart, and God is going to give you an opportunity. And when he gives you that opportunity, share your faith. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. I want to pray that your Holy Spirit um, helps us Lord, make us sensitive to the people that you are working in around us. Lord, give us great boldness. May we not be ashamed of this gospel. It is powerful. It is powerful not because of us. It is powerful because of you. And everyone can hear. And Lord, some of those that we speak to in the coming weeks may turn and believe. And it's to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.